Today we'll have a meditation on John 9. We'll also have a tour of the cemetery and a couple of original songs I've written and performed with a guitar. And we hope you have a, a wonderful time today. Thank you and welcome to Providence Church. During this time of battling the virus, the quarantines, the stay at home, the takeouts, etc., we're trying to provide some spiritual encouragement to you and also uh, keep you connected with what's happening here at Providence Church. Today we're looking at John chapter 9, verses 1 through 11. And he went along and saw a blind man from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, put it on the man's eyes, said, Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open? they demanded. He replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. May God bless this reading for not only our enrichment, but our encouragement in these times of sometimes spiritual darkness and blindness. Most of you probably heard about uh, this young boy named Louis, or Louis. It was 1818 in France, and he was a boy of about nine years old. He was enjoying working in his father's workshop. The father was a harness maker, and the boy loved to watch his father work with leather. <clears throat> Someday he thought he would be just like his father. And his father said, why not start now? So he took a piece of leather and he drew a design on it. And he said, now, my son, take the hole puncher and a hammer and follow the design and be careful that you don't hit your hand. Boy, the, he was just really excited and he began to work. But when he hit the hole puncher, it flew out of his hand and pierced his eye. He lost the sight of that eye immediately, and later the sight in the other eye failed. And Louis was now totally blind. But a few years later, he was sitting in the family garden when a friend handed him a pine cone. And as he ran his sensitive fingers over that pine cone, an idea came to him. He became really enthusiastic and began to create an alphabet of raised dots on paper so that the blind could feel and interpret what was written. Thus, Louis Braille, or Louis Braille, opened up a whole new world for the blind, all because of an accident or a traumatic event. Now, I saw the other day where <laughs> there was an email that had some things in it, like uh, what children have learned, and one was, no matter how hard it is, and no matter how hard you try, you cannot baptize a cat. <laughs> or another one was, when your mom is mad at your dad, don't let her brush your hair. And then, of course, the other one that I guess everybody's heard, never ask a, your three-year-old brother to hold a tomato or an egg. Now, it's obvious that you could tell that, you know, these kids, um, they learn these great truth probably from some dramatic eye-opening experience in their own personal lives like probably if you can imagine them well let's baptize the cat and probably they tried it and they found out the hard way and then uh, I suspect that uh, mom and dad had had a quarrel and uh, 
About that time, she was taking it out on the hair of her child's head. Anyway, we found in life that a dramatic, personal, eye-opening experience can give us new insight and new perception and new vision. Now, I used our camera today to look at a box of wonderful eyeglasses that are being recycled because you may not be able to tell me how many eyeglasses are in this box, but to someone in the world, they're really glad that one pair of those eyeglasses, that's their prescription, is in the box. And so, on a much deeper level in the scriptures today, we see where a traumatic experience uh, didn't really happen to this man but he was born that way, and it was tragic. And yet, good news came to him, and he came back with 2020 vision from his journey to the pool. But we know in our lives that even though we may have been born in a good situation, tragedy can strike so quickly. We've been living in the world with that reality, particularly in our age group, since 9-11, and when the towers were brought down by some evil people. And now, in this world, we're dealing with COVID-19 virus. And this uncertain nature of what it's brought to our everyday lives, being quarantined and washing hands and being very, very careful of staying away from other people who might have it, and hearing that cases have been discovered around us. And so... We need to remember that there are people in this world that oftentimes have the ability to see, both physically and spiritually, but many times we are either too busy or too overloaded. For instance, you, know, may, you may know people that are, have selective hearing. Some of you husbands uh, may have selective hearing when the wife asks you to do something, and vice versa. Some of you wives may also have selective hearing when the husband says something to you. However, it's not surprising because our senses are bombarded daily with all this data. We have the data of feeling the seat that we're sitting on, the temperature in the room. And, and so all this comes and we have to be selective because we can't take it all in. And so our goal amongst all of this many, many pieces of data in our life for all of us, if we're followers of Christ, is to see the same things that he sees and be selective in finding out what it is that's important to him. We want to see and notice what's important to Christ. And we miss it. We get too busy. We've got a better idea. And we uh, get focused on non-essentials. Our mind is overstimulated with televisions, iPads, CDs, computers, you name it things that are just being invented as we speak. The coffee table is full of magazines and newspapers. The mailbox is full of junk mail and sweepstakes. We even go to have recreation to recreate, and we become excessive, and we have to have the world's greatest triathlon thing or the world's greatest whatever it is that we're... And so, you see, we come back exhausted. Now, there was a guy one time who was truly, he thought born with really good vision, and his name was John Newton. It was back in the, uh, oh, the late 18th century, and, and he was a self-educated man, but he had gone to sea, and at one time he was a captain of the ship uh, bringing back African slaves in that African slave trade business. But then he was converted to Christianity, and he became an ordained minister and the Church of England, and finally he was serving as a rector in the Church of London, and his personal testimony through these years has referred to his time of blindness. He says he was really spiritually blind, a spiritual wretch, uh, when he was working in that slave tr trade. But through an amazing grace, his eyes were opened, and he could see clearly God's will for his life, and it was not to haul slaves. And, of course, the song, Amazing Grace, <clears throat> How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. 
I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. It's truly the testimony of John Newton. He had learned to be able to see what was important to God through his son, Jesus Christ, and the power of his Holy Spirit. There's an old story of a beggar who was sitting across the street from an artist studio. The artist saw him, and he thought it would make an interesting portrait, so he spent a lot of time uh, painting the man. The man was uh, obviously defeated, whose shoulders were drooped, his eyes were downcast, he was sad. And so when the artist finished this painting, he took it over to the beggar. And the beggar said, who is that? Uh, the painting bore a slight resemblance to him, but it was a person of dignity with squared shoulders and uplifted eyes and almost handsome. And he asked the artist, is that me? I don't look like that. But the artist replied these words, but that is the person I see in you. And you see, you and I are being seen by God each day and he sees in us much more than we ever see in ourselves and the same is true with those around us in this world are we treating others with the respect that God would treat them with are we seeing them with the potential God sees in them are we learning to live with each other in this world we can only do it through surrendering our will and our lives, our vision, our eyesight, and our understanding to God. So today, you may think this COVID virus, like 19 it's called, COVID-19, you may think it's horrible, and indeed it is, and bad things are happening, but God is still in control and much more powerful than the Twin Tower incident or the COVID-19 incident or the thing you're facing in your life incident. And perhaps maybe this old Chinese legend of an old man and his only son will help bring a little insight into it. One night, the old man's horse escaped and the neighbors came to comfort him in his loss. How do you know this is a bad thing? He asked them. Several days later, the horse returned with a herd of wild horses. Now his friends came to congratulate the farmer on his good fortune that he had all these horses. But the old man said, how do you know this is a good thing? While his son was trying to tame one of the wild horses, he is thrown and he breaks his leg. And again, his friends gathered to bemoan this new misfortune. But the old man asked, how do you know this is a bad thing? And by that time, uh, a warlord came to recruit his uh, all the able-bodied youth for the army, and the farmer's son was not uh, taken because he had of a broken leg. And in true fashion, the farmer's name came to express their pleasure. How do you know it's a good thing? And you see that this story can go back and forth. And oftentimes, we let the events and the incidents and the seemingly tragic things in our lives sway us back and then forth. Someone says, don't read the press clippings, whether good or bad. For you see, good fortune can quickly turn on you, but also bad fortune may be a blessing in disguise. We as Christians need to not look at the surroundings and what's happening to us, but to look at the creator of everything and remember that even though Christ may come and for a time put mud on our eyes, he sends us to the cleansing pool of the blood of Jesus Christ to have our sin washed away, but also our vision cleared so that in this year 2020, we can have 2020 vision to begin to move forward and act appropriately as God would have us. God bless you. Heavenly Father, give us a new vision now as we go through the midst of dark times in this world to be able to see as you would see, not only to see ourselves but others as you see us and help us to act appropriately in the name of Christ and for his sake that his sacrifice would not be in vain.
Providence Church began in 1763 as a log structure, as a meeting house, a church gathering spot, a burial grounds, and today we're going to look quickly and briefly in the burial grounds, Providence Memorial Cemetery. The oldest part of the cemetery is now what is called railroad tracks. However, in the very beginning, it was an old Indian trading path, and then it was a stagecoach path, and then it became an artery for the railroad. And many of the earlier graves are no longer available due to having wooden headstones and uh, markers like that. However, you can see the actual church is a long way from where this corner is located here in the cemetery. There are actually four sections to the cemetery, this being the oldest section that goes up to about this tree line. Many of the earlier settlers have family members who are buried in the older section. You can see where the number of headstones picks up in the second section. Some familiar names like Whitsit and Holt and Andrews and Rich and many others are buried here. The connection with the Turntines and the Cellars and Benjamin Rainey uh, all go back to this cemetery and many of them lie at rest here. A very popular name that has many, many people reared out here would be the Hardin family, who among many others were instrumental in the beginnings of Graham in Alamance County. As we move into the next section of the cemetery, you'll notice this marker with the little flag beside it and the little curved top. And if we pan back, you'll see the green sign which indicates the middle of where the fourth structure was built from 1865 to 1870. And I'll show you a picture later that will help you identify how we found out that structure. graves that are buried in this section are younger than 1927. All the graves buried around this section were older than 1927. The church building was actually moved in 1927. This indicates the northwest corner of the building. As we pan up, you can see that indicates the southwest corner of the building there, and then you can see how far the church was moved, 225 feet in 1927. At that point in 1927, it was a wooden framed church building, and after it was moved, it was brick where it is now. That particular move was engineered 
in a way to not cause structural damage to the church. And this, of course, is the center of where the building once stood. As we pan over, you can see the new section of the cemetery that was expanded after the church was moved. A new section has been opened just past the edge of these markers down the hill and over to the right and grave sites are available for purchase now. Hey! 